Welcome to another Revelation study. We are presently going through the letters to the seven churches. We're on the second church today, the letter to the church at Smyrna. So we are calling this, You've Got Mail, the church at Smyrna. It's also the poor little rich church. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 is our text. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcome shall not be hurt of the second death. And may the Lord add his blessing to his word. Amen. Now this is the shortest of all the letters. This is the only city really that is still standing today. And the church is still suffering persecution there in that part of the world. There are just a few hundred believers there today, but they are holding fast to the faith. You may have heard of a man named Ignatius. He was a contemporary with the Apostle John. He was Bishop of Antioch in Syria. He was probably the second or the third bishop of that city. He was arrested about 20 years after the book of Revelation was written. He was later taken to Rome where he was martyred for Christ. On his way there, he wrote letters to several churches. Uh, we still have those letters today. And as he was to be martyred, one of his statements was, I am the wheat of God. I'm ground by the teeth of the wild beast, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. Now, there were ten men who guarded him. He called them the ten lepers. But they were ten Roman soldiers. And he said, the kinder I was to them, the meaner they were to me. And one, on the final day of the games there in Rome, two lions were loosed upon him. And as they began to maul him, he cried out, Now I begin to be a Christian. That statement highlights the truth. One of the characteristics of Christianity is suffering. We don't like to hear that, especially in, in our uh, Western world today. Many Christians in the world are still being persecuted and suffering greatly uh, for their faith. The New Testament clearly teaches that being a Christian will cost all of us something. In fact, the two great hallmarks of the Christian life are love and suffering. Love is what we learned about in the last message, the letter to the church at Ephesus, where they were told to return to their first love. And in this letter, we see the persecution and the suffering that these believers endured. Jesus said that we are to take up our cross daily and follow him. And that may mean that someday we would have to give up our life and pay the ultimate price uh, for his glory. Back in John chapter 15, Jesus said these words. And think of them in the light of the culture in which we are living today. John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, since I chose you out of the world, the world therefore hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my words, they will keep yours also. And then John chapter 16 and verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then Acts chapter 14 and verse 22 strengthening the minds of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, to go through many afflictions 
and thus enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Philippians chapter 1 verse 29 For to you it was granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And Colossians chapter 1 and verse 24 Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sakes, and fill up in my flesh that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ, for the sake of his body, which is the church. And remember Jesus said, Woe when all men speak well of you. Uh, too many won't speak up today uh, for fear of offending someone. Now, we should never invite suffering or mistreatment. I mean, don't look for trouble. Don't go looking for trouble uh, to make yourself look more spiritual. But on the other hand, we should never lightly throw away the freedoms God has given us in this culture. They are to be greatly valued. So this letter is a message to get off the road of least resistance and follow the cross. In fact, worldwide, about 500 Christians die every day for their faith. Every day there's the equivalent of a 9-11. That many people die, or, or every week there's that equivalent. Every week that many people die. So far here in America, we don't experience that. We have a, a reprieve but that is no guarantee that it will last forever. With that thought in mind, let's step into the context of this second letter. The church of Smyrna was this persecuted church, a suffering church. And we have great spiritual riches in this life because of the hope of heaven uh, in this life and the life to come. Therefore, not, we are not afraid to stand boldly and faithfully for the Lord. So the first thing I want to look at is the setting. And we see here the setting in verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. So it's, it would be the next stop for that first century postman as he would leave Ephesus. He would go up the coast about 35 miles to Smyrna, a city with a population of about 20,000 people. It was really a beautiful city. The skyline was called the Crown of Smyrna. They erected a temple there in honor of Tiberius. That, of course, put the Christians at odds with the government. They were seen as being unpatriotic uh, by their other fellow citizens. So it was okay in that day to worship Jesus along with other gods, but it was not acceptable to worship Jesus exclusively. But really to add anything to Jesus is to subtract from Jesus. And because the Christians wouldn't worship these other gods and wouldn't worship the emperor as God, they were suffering persecution. The second thing we want to look at is the Savior. Notice that he is the first and the last who was dead and he came to life. He's the one who says these things. Jesus wants them to realize who he is. He wants them to know who's in their corner, that he's in their corner. And now knowing who is for them and who is with them would give them strength to face the pressures that they were facing in their society. Now there are two things that are stated here about Jesus. The first, he says, I am the first and the last. That means he is sovereign over life. The emphasis is on the deity and the dominion of Jesus Christ. In fact, Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So when this statement is made about Jesus, it's a statement that's saying that he is God, that he is equal with the Father. The same thing that was said about the Father in the Old Testament is said about Jesus here that he is the first and the last. Really, I believe that that is talking about Jesus there in the Old Testament. So a statement here that Jesus is equal to God. He is the one that created everything. He's the first. He's the one who will bring it all to completion. He's the last. He's, we could say he's the bookends of all of history. And that's a comfort to know 
that the events of history and the events of our lives unfold within the parameters of his plan. This might be a reference also to the fact that Smyrna prided itself in being the first city in Asia, first city established there. The second statement is that Jesus is supreme over death. He was dead, but he has come back to life. He may be appealing to some local images there because the city had once died. It was defeated by the Lydians in 600 BC, but the city was resurrected and rebuilt again by the Greeks in 300 BC. So now we come to the heart of this letter, and that is the sufferings. This was a dangerous place to be if you were a believer in Christ. Once a year, everyone was required to go to the temple. They would light incense, they would burn incense, and they would say, Caesar is Lord. And of course, the confession of the believer is Jesus Christ is Lord. So these believers refused to do this, to burn this incense, and utter those oaths that, Caesar was Lord, and because they would not do that, they suffered greatly. You will notice that in this letter, there is no condemnation from Jesus. And I wonder if their suffering had something to do with that. Their suffering had a way of purifying their life. That's true in our lives as well. Suffering brings purification with it. But there's five traits of their suffering here. The first one is pressure. He said, I know your works and tribulation. That word means to be under crushing pressure, like a vice grip. These believers were getting it from all sides. The word Smyrna, in fact, means myrrh. It comes from the word myrrh. And it was used as an embalming agent. Uh, the suffering that took place. The martyrdom that uh, happened to the Christians there. They're accused of being politically disloyal. But in the midst of this, Jesus says, I know your tribulation. I know the pressure. I know the crushing pressure that you are under. But Jesus knows more than just about it. He knows what they are going through. Jesus understands our suffering because he suffered more than any of us ever will. And he suffered in ways we could never imagine and never completely understand. Jesus was cursed of man and cursed of God as he hung there on the cross. So when he says, I know your tribulation, these words are not hollow words. My knowing, though, should be an encouragement to me. That is a powerful encouragement to me that he knows and he understands uh, my suffering. So the first thing was pressure. The second thing was poverty. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. And the word poverty there means extreme poverty. So you have to understand that the Christians would have been boycotted. So what does Jesus say though? He says you are rich. How are they rich? They are rich in faith. Their faith compensated for the, what they lacked in the physical. Rich in the knowledge of God. Rich in the mercy of God. Everything one could think of spiritually they possessed. They were rich in. A tax collector, tax collects, collector went to a home of a poor pastor one day. He wanted to determine the amount of taxes he would have to pay. And he asked, what do you possess? And the pastor said, oh, I'm very wealthy. He said, would you list your possessions, please? The pastor said, well, first I have eternal life. Second, I have a house in heaven. Third, I have peace that passes understanding. Fourth, I have joy unspeakable. Fifth, I have divine love that never fails. Sixth, I have a faithful, godly wife. Seventh, I have a happy, healthy, obedient children. Eighth, I have true, faithful friends. Ninth, I have songs in the night. Tenth, I have a crown of life awaiting me in heaven. The tax collector closed his book and said, Truly, you are a very rich man, but your riches, your property, is not subject to taxation. We have a lot of riches as Christians that are not subject to taxation. In fact, I've heard it said that there are four kinds of people. 
There are the poor poor. They are poor financially. And they are poor spiritually. They don't know God. There are the rich poor, or the poor rich. Uh, that is the people here. They were poor in the things of the world, but they were rich in the things of God. Then there is the rich poor. They are rich financially, but poor spiritually. And fourth, those, uh, they, they are those who are rich financially and rich spiritually. The rich rich. The important thing is to have the spiritual riches uh, that we have in Christ and to be rich toward God. The next thing the church was enduring was slander. It says there, the, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There was a large Jewish population there in Smyrna. The Jews were lodging complaints against these Christians, these believers, by slandering them to the authorities. To the authorities and then they would serve as witnesses against them. And Jesus said about them, they say they are Jews but they are not, but rather they are the synagogue of Satan. And what he means by this is that they are certainly Jews ethnically, but they are not true Jews in that they don't have faith uh, in the Lord. Romans 8, 28 and 29 says, For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision that is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Christians here were on society's blacklist and Satan's hit list. Satan was the one energizing them to come against God's people. The, the next thing they were suffering was prison. Was, Look, the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tried. You notice that the devil is mentioned here again. Satan means adversary and devil means accuser. So Satan is our adver adversary, but he's also our accuser. And he's actively involved in the city there and the leaders there, and what's going on. It looks like the government authorities are the one behind uh, this, but really Satan is the one behind it all. And the final thing they face is death. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Some of these believers had to seal their testimony in their own blood. So those were the traits of what they were suffering. But now the Lord tells them there's a test. He said, look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you might be tested, that you might be tried. So what Satan does, he tempts us, tempts us to and en entices us away from God. But God's pur purpose in all of this is to refine us and mature us. Whenever you are going through a fiery trial, always remember that God has his hand on the thermostat. And the test was working because the people were being refined. They were being purified. Again, nothing negative was said by Jesus about this church. But notice also the time of their suffering. You will have tribulation for 10 days. It, the, the view that I believe here is that this is really, uh, or one view, let's, let's go over reverse, uh, rehearse the views. One view is that it's symbolic. It's just symbolic for... Uh, a short period of time. The problem is with that, if you go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So in the book of Revelation, when God wants to say something that is short, he'll just use the term short. Uh, he does the same thing in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 3. Other people take this symbolically as 10 periods of Roman persecution that existed under 10 different emperors. Well, to, that, to me, that seems like a very complicated idea for such a, from such a simple statement. The last view is the literal. Uh, 10 days is 10 days. So in other words, there's coming a, a very intense, concentrated time of persecution and that incredible assault will last for 10 days. And that's the view that I hold. But the point to all of this is, though, that there is a limit to it. God set the limit. 
One of my favorite phrases in the Bible is, and it came to pass. I mean, whatever you are suffering um, is not going to last forever. But God not only has his hand on the thermostat, but he has his hand on the timer as well. God gives the, an expiration date to our suffering. We can endure suffering because we know that suffering will not endure. We either get relief in this life or God will take us to heaven and we will get relief there. Our culture is becoming increasingly intolerant to exclusive claims of truth. There is going to be a collision between us who believe in absolute truth and those who don't. This culture claims to be tolerant, but they aren't tolerant of that. So what's the solution? Jesus goes on and gives them the solution or the prescription to all of, all of this. He tells them in verse 10, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. The Greek means stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. The second thing is that we should, re we should realize that we don't have to fear. Fear not. Don't fear any of these any of these things and then the second thing is just to be faithful be faithful you'll be tried but be faithful unto death and I will give thee the crown of life and then the third thing here uh, that he that he mentions is that we just have to um, hear what the Spirit would say and that is to be an overcomer that we will not be hurt of the second death now, these believers, they were facing death, remember? But there is a, another death that they didn't have to worry about, and that's the second death. That is the final judgment that comes upon uh, the unbelievers. And so we have to look at things from an eternal perspective, and that's what Jesus is telling us here. Look at it from an, an eternal perspective. Don't look at the temporary suffering, but look at the glory that awaits us, the glory to follow as Paul says. And by the way here, um, this talks here, the second death, refers to, as we'll discuss that later on in Revelation, but this teaches that there is a hell, and hell is eternal. Uh, the lake of fire is eternal. And so that's one thing I just wanted to point out here, is we'll talk about that as we go along, because many Christians today believe that um, there is no hell. Others believe that there is not an eternal existence uh, for those who go there. But the Bible teaches otherwise, and Jesus himself does. So this is the second church, the church at Smyrna, the poor, rich church. And I hope today that you are poor, rich, or rich, rich. I hope that you are rich in the things of God, and those are the things that we strive for and no matter what you don't have in this life all of us can still be rich in God and and God compensates for our lack of riches by giving us more faith so God bless you have a great day